happy Memorial Day weekend. I hope you have a great one. But here we're going to remember and memorialize the one who came to save you, number one of us. So let's stand as we worship Jesus Christ, our Lord, and just enjoy worship this morning and praise the Lord.
the battle does belong to the Lord. And he can win every battle such that you no longer need to fear. You no longer need to be slain to fear. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with the song. The deliverance from my enemy till all my feet are gone. Everybody, I'm no longer slave to be. I am a child. I'm no longer. mother's womb, oh, you have chosen me, the love has fallen my name, and I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins, I'm the slaves to fear because we are children of the living God. But also you, you think of Memorial Day. This is Memorial Day weekend. And it's also true that because of those who have gone before us, 
in the spot battle on this globe, but we can also not be fearful about the enemy who is today. It is Memorial Day weekend. Many of you probably already know Memorial Day was first unofficially observed immediately following the Civil War. And there were important What's going through that scene? Yes. Okay. Immediately following the Civil War. And there were impromptu gatherings at various locations to remember those who had fallen in that great conflict. Now, since then, it was expanded to honor all soldiers of the United States of America who have fallen while fighting in any war. And it was, it was officially adopted as a national holiday in 1971. So I would urge each of us this weekend to take some time to remember thankful for those who have fallen in battle and have given the ultimate sacrifice to secure the freedoms that we enjoy today. And in addition, you know, it's also become a time for us to simply remember and give thanks for and honor family members and friends who have passed from this life to the next. You know, it, it's good and appropriate for us to take time to remember and appreciate fallen soldiers and our loved ones, but it is most important that we always remember and give thanks and honor and praise to the one who didn't just rescue us uh, and, and secure earthly freedoms, but rather he secured an eternal freedom for each and every one. May we never forget that great sacrifice of the one who suffered and died on a cross for each and every one of us. Today, as we remember the those who have sacrificed their lives, let's not lose sight of the one who died to set us free eternally. The one who suffered and died on a cross to release us from our bondage. Jesus gave his life out of submission to the Father's will. He sacrificed himself out of his perfect love. Today, we remember the cost of our freedom, the great sacrifice, a sacrifice so that we could live free. And we're going to celebrate communion now as we do this little song. So, fellas, as we uh, get ready to go today. And if you're visiting with us, maybe for the first time, we need to encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, to participate with us in this communion. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, grief was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great Left behind heaven's throne, build it here inside, and there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, free my soul for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of my. Thank you, Jesus, it has won. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into the light. 
I was, uh, I was thinking this morning as I came to worship that I'm, I'm so thankful that we experience all the different emotions that we do in worship, and I'm thankful that we can even be experiencing those kinds of emotions as we come to worship. M my heart is always happy when I come to worship. There's always a happiness in me that uh, I think prepares me for worship, but I, I have to admit, my, my heart's a bit heavy today. How about yours? It's been a tough week. It's been a tough week for our country, been a tough week for our church family. Our friend Dan Norton is over in uh, St. John's Hospital and uh, suffered a fall this week, wheelchair tipped backwards, hit his head, uh, has a brain bleed that can't be fixed, and this morning they're unhooking the ventilator, and it'd be a matter of days probably for Dan before he graduates to glory, unless God has a, a different plan for him, but my heart's heavy for Lou Ann and, and uh, the kids and the grandkids and that, that, whole, that whole family. Pray for them, if you would, find a way to encourage them. And then this situation in, in Uvalde, Texas, with the school shooting, no, um, no classroom ought to be a crime scene. No school zone ought to be a war zone. No, no second grader ought to have to say on national TV, I'm scared to go back to school in the fall. I don't want to go back. And to say that all those kids who were killed were friends, friends of his. And I just hope that we're doing what we can to lift up those, those families and, and uh, that community and all those that are working in, in that, that situation. So it's okay to come to worship with a heavy heart. God, God's really good at helping lighten the load from our hearts as we move into a time of worship. And this is an important weekend as we talk about Memorial Day weekend, and we'll talk a little bit about it patriotically, but really more from a spiritual standpoint. I, I want to talk to you today about building memorials before God, because I believe that's what we're doing with our lives, or at least it's what we ought to be doing with our lives. But when we think about freedom and, and, and memories politically, you understand that the vast majority of memorials that man creates and builds are somehow connected with wars and the price that Americans have paid for the freedoms that we all enjoy. Just a quick Google search will let you know that we've lost 1.1 million American soldiers when you put all of the wars that we've been involved in together, 1.1 million. Of course, the Civil War is responsible for about half of that, about a half a million died during that, that war. World War II, almost 400,000 died during, during that war. So I want to just scroll through some, some pictures for you and and show you some memorials that are tied to those wars and those casualties. Uh, we'll kind of start recent, then go, go back. The USS New York was built with steel from the rubble of the World Trade Center after the attacks on 9-11 of 2001. It was launched on November the 7th, 2009. Seven and a half tons of twisted and mangled steel from ground zero had been melted down to form the bow of the new ship as, quote, a symbol of our unshakable resolve, end quote. The ship cost about a billion dollars to build and carries 360 soldiers and 700 combat-ready Marines. The USS New York was built in the shipyards in New Orleans by many workers who had lost homes and businesses due to Hurricane Katrina. Think about that. They had to rebuild their lives and their homes at the same time as they built the ship as America was rebuilding their lives as well. Two more ships like the USS New York were also constructed. The USS Arlington was built to memorialize the attack on the Pentagon. It was launched on November 23rd of 2010. And then there's the USS Somerset, named after the Pennsylvania County where United Airlines Flight 93 crashed. This ship was launched on April the 14th of 2012. Here's a picture of the Minutemen statue found on the Lexington Green in Massachusetts, marks the first major encounter of our American militia made up of farmers and shopkeepers and citizen soldiers who fought and defeated nearly a 1,000 soldiers of the superpower of the day, King George's Redcoats of the British Army. 
this marked the birth of a nation that would be established on equal rights for every man, but we learned that equal rights was a little harder to come by for some Americans, as black people were never fully given equality until President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. This memorial honors the Battle of Gettysburg, where 51,000 men died in three days trying to determine whether all men would truly be equal. And as I said, just, just under a half a million Americans died in the Civil War. The, <clears throat> the largest memorial in our nation is the National World War II Memorial. If you've seen it, it's divided into the Atlantic and the Pacific theaters. I think the Atlantic side is shown in this picture. This memorial marks the sacrifices of millions of Americans who are called the greatest generation because they fought and conquered aggression around the world and paid a heavy price for our freedom. As I said, 400, nearly 400,000 died. No memorial could truly honor the many who gave their lives. When you look at national cemeteries with thousands upon thousands of white grave markers in perfect alignment, almost as far as you can see, you're moved by the sacrifice in lives that it has cost for us to be here today. And those fallen heroes deserve all the honor we can, we can give them. Just a few, year, few years later, we were caught up in another conflict called the Korean War. And a new memorial was built to honor those who fought there as well. It's kind of cool. It depicts a squad of infantry soldiers as they're walking through the fields on, on patrol. For 10 years, there was a war some Americans thought should never have been fought because millions of soldiers served there. Over 58,000 people died. And regardless of your feeling about the Vietnam War, it cannot and should not be erased from our history. You've seen this wall before the Vietnam Wall, which was built to honor those who fought and died in what some have called the most unpopular war in American history. And then 21 years ago, President George W. Bush declared war on terrorism again after the 9-11 attacks. Took the lives of nearly 3,000 people at the World Trade Center in New York. And there's that uh, memorial there. I'd, I'd love to travel someday and, and see that. Here's one near the Pentagon, at the Pentagon near Washington, D.C. And then uh, the next one is in a field located outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The 9-11 attacks sent many soldiers to Afghanistan and Iraq. To my knowledge, there are no national memorials honoring the follow, fallen heroes there, but someday there, there will be as they deserve our honor as much as any other soldiers who have served our, our nation. And You look at these pictures and you think about these conflicts or wars, whatever you, you want to call them, and, and I, I love what Abraham Lincoln said near the end of the Civil War, when considering those who had died on the battlefield, here's what he said, through their deeds, the dead of battle have spoken more eloquently for themselves than any of the living ever could. But we can only honor them by rededicating ourselves, listen to this, to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. I like those words. Because I think we need to see this distinction. That again, memorials that have been created and built by the hands of men, they, they tend to focus on cost and casualties. But I think memorials that are built before God do consider the cost because there is a cost to be paid for following Christ. We see that in his teachings. But they're, all, but they're always connected to cause and commitment. And I'm not saying that these conflicts and these wars, that there wasn't just cause. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying when we memorialize them, it seems like we focus just on cost and, and casualty. And sometimes don't consider the cause. How honorable and how noble the cause was. And I think as believers in Christ, we need to understand that yes, there's a cost, but it's always tied to cause. It's always tied to commitment. It's always tied to what it is that God has, has called us to do. I, I echo what Gordon said this morning, that it would be good for us on this Memorial Day weekend to honor and recognize and remember those who have defended our freedom and to still pray for those who are bearing arms right now at this very, this very moment to, to defend us and protect us. 
I think it's a good time to let people know that you're a true American patriot. Fly your American flag. Show your support for our nation. We have our problems, many, many, many problems, but there's still no place on earth I'd rather be than right here in America. As long as I'm a pilgrim, a stranger in this world, I'm glad God allowed me to travel through this life as an American citizen. But for the message today, since my true home is not of this present world, I'm just passing by, I think it's good to think about what kind of memorials there will be in our home in heaven. What kind of memorials are being built up there? I, I'm going to spend eternity in that place. And I think it'd be good to know that, that I've built the right kind of memorials through my life. So what I want to do this morning really is just share two stories with you. And these stories are unique because, to my knowledge, God says things in these two stories through Jesus that, that aren't said anywhere else in Scripture. So what, what kind of memorials does, does God recognize? What are the ones that bring a smile to His face? First of all, I would say this. The, the, the right kind of memorial is service that's rendered from a pure heart of love for God. My, my favorite New Testament story is Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. If you want to turn to that, you can. We'll have some of the scriptures up on the screen. But man, I love this story. And again, I love it because Jesus says something about this woman in the story that, again, to my knowledge, he doesn't say about anybody else, only her. There must have been something she did that really caught Jesus' attention and caught the attention of the Father as well. Perhaps you've heard the story beginning in verse 1, Mark 14. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, they said, or the people may, may riot. While he was in Bethany, that's Jesus reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. <laughs> Jesus is chomping at the bit to speak, and, and he jumps right in and says, leave her alone. I love that about Jesus. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. Problem was, they didn't want to. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Here it is. Here it is. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told, listen, in memory of her. Some translations say as a memorial for her. Now here's the cool thing. Prophecy is being fulfilled right here this morning. You just experienced it. Jesus said anytime the gospel is preached, and that's what we're doing here this morning, is preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Anytime it's preached, we'll talk about her. We'll talk about her, and, that, and that's what we're, we're doing this morning. But I think her service is a perfect example of the kind of service that God wants to memorialize. The Passover feast was over. The chief priests and, and, and the scribes are looking for a way uh, to get rid of Jesus. They wouldn't do it during the feast days because... The, the people would riot, but now that the feast is over, most of the people would never notice that they condemned an innocent man to die. Jesus having a meal with, with Simon in Bethany. He sits down to enjoy the meal. And this woman just comes in. We don't know for sure why or from where, but she just comes in with this very expensive jar of perfume. We're told that it was possibly worth a year's wages. And she just breaks the top off this bottle. She just, she just breaks the top off the bottle and poured all of its contents over the head of, of Jesus. And as the scripture says, that made some of the people very angry. We're going to return to that in just a moment. In their mind, it was a waste of expensive ointment that could have been sold for a lot of money. These were poor people, and that money could have gone a long way to make life easier for them. 
And again, I love Jesus' defense of her in verses 6 through 8. Leave her alone. I mean, why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. I love this phrase. She did what she could. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand, before my burial. In just a few hours, Jesus would die on the cross. And this ointment was the symbol of the woman's great love for her Lord. And again, Mark 14, 9 is the verse we're looking for when Jesus says something astounding. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial. A memorial to her. God memorialized this act of service rendered from a pure heart of love for him. Now, obviously, we can't do what this, whim, this woman did. We can't pour ointment over the head of Jesus, but we can still serve him out of a pure heart of love. I'm just asking this morning, how much do you truly love your Lord? Like this woman, can it be said of you, you you've done what you could, you, you do what you can. Are you willing to give your best to him, expecting nothing in return? Are you willing to give to God that which really cost you something? What Jesus called a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, I want to go back to verse 4 because the response of some of the dinner guests was what? What a waste. I like it from the Message Bible where it says, Some of the guests became furious among themselves. That's criminal. <laughs> a sheer waste. This perfume could have been sold for well over a year's wages and handed out to the poor. My guess is no one was getting in line to volunteer to do that. And it says they swelled up in anger, nearly bursting with indignation over her. And when I, what I want to do is show you something that's pretty obvious to me in, in the text. Are you seeing this? Are you picking up what's being thrown down here? That what Jesus sees as an extravagant act of heartfelt love is viewed, by, is viewed by others as what? A reckless demonstration of willful wastefulness. Don't miss this. What Jesus saw as beautiful, many saw as being a waste. I mean, this was before the Brill Cream commercial that used to say, hey, little dabble do ya. Some of you are too young to remember that. I mean, these people were thinking, just pop the top and pour a couple of drops of nard on the head of Jesus. But did she have to break open the top and pour the entire bottle on him? You want to know the answer to that question? No, she did not have to. That was not required. That was not necessary. But this woman lost herself in loving service for her Lord. Chew on that a while. I mean, when's the last time that happened to you? When's the last time that happened to me? Man, you just couldn't help yourself. <laughs> you were so overwhelmed with love and gratitude for your Lord. You had to do something. You had to do something extra. Something over the top for the one who demonstrated extravagant love for you from the cross. What we just celebrated through the Lord's Supper. Folks, here's an important truth. It costs a lot to give your best to God. It costs a lot to give your best to God. I told you I love this passage. 37 years ago, on February the 1st, 1985, I was 21 years old. Imagine that, 21 years old. I had to preach a senior chapel service at St. Louis Christian College. Never been so nervous in my life, well, except when I got married. I was nervous about this, preaching in front of all my professors and friends and family and, and all of that. I've still got the sermon Still got the sermon. Want to know what the title was? I keep in mind, I was 21. Extra, extra, read all about it. That was the title of the sermon. I thought it was pretty good. You don't seem impressed at all. Someone wanted me to use the title committed or contented. To me, that was just, it was boring, just to be real honest. I, I think it needed to have a, a little more zeal. And, and I preached, I preached that passage, and I threw, I threw in also, this, this guy named Barnabas who went out and sold an entire tract of land and gave all the money to the apostles to feed the poor. 
And I, I just always love this passage because I think, I think what it says is that there is, there is an extravagance, there is an extraness. I know that's not a word, today it is. There is an extraness in, in serving Jesus. And again, what some see as extra, others see as a waste. They see it as more than necessary. I mean, it said days wages, or years wages on, on this jar of perfume. I, I did a little research, and last year, the, the average income in the United States was right around $45,000. So I come into your house, and your daughter greets me by breaking open a bottle of perfume, and she pours it over my head, and you learned that that bottle of perfume was worth $45,000, and you'd say something like this, Mike's a pretty good old boy, but he's not that good. He's not that good. Again, what, what's seen as extra is seen as a waste. You buy something worth $10, and you give $20 for it. Some would say you wasted $10. This one fits my life perfectly. It takes two hours to fix something that should have taken an hour. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't say that without laughing. They say you wasted an hour. You did more than what was necessary. I, I want to ask you this question this morning. Did Jesus promote the idea of doing more than what's necessary? I believe he did. Help me with these. If a man asks you to go one mile, go with him two. What do we call that? The, it's the extra mile. If a man strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other cheek that's the extra cheek if a man wants your shirt offer him your coat or tunic it's the extra piece of clothing Jesus said you've heard it said love your neighbor but I say to you love your love your enemy love those who persecute you the Sermon on the Mount is full of teaching on the extraness of serving Jesus and here here's my problem with my own life too many times and with the lives of people in the church that I think mean well. Too many people bemoan the idea of doing too little while seeking to do just enough. That, that's just a fact. You only hear people say, oh, I need to pray more. Or, I need to give more. I, I need to worship more. I need to read my Bible more. I've yet to hear somebody say, man, I'm reading my Bible so much now, I don't have time to do anything else. I've got to do something about this. Or I'm giving so much of my money, I'm having a hard time paying my bills at home because there are times I just feel led by God to empty my wallet for something that, that is such a good cause or so, so noble. You rarely hear people say, I'm giving too much, I'm doing too much. Most of the time we bemoan that. We're, 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 we're doing too little, but we're looking, we're looking at just just enough and I think God just wants us to break open our bottle and do some extra things for him I love the story of Zacchaeus I guess because he's another one of those famous little short guys and and uh, Jesus calls him down out of the tree and goes to his house and convicted him of the fact that he cheated a whole lot of people as the tax collector and Jesus made that great statement, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. You remember what he did after that, what Zacchaeus did after that? He went to those that he had cheated and said, here's the deal. If I cheated you, I'll pay you back four times over what, what I cheated you. Was that necessary? No. Was it required? No. In that instance for Zacchaeus, was it something he should have done? A absolutely, because he... He was doing it out of response for what this man who brought salvation to his house could, could do. So again, I, I'm just asking you this morning because I, I have to ask myself the same question. Am I committed or just contented to, to, do, to do the bare minimum, to do what's necessary, to, to do, to do what, what God has asked? Or am I going to just break the top off of this thing and build a memorial to God one that is service that's rendered out of a pure heart of love for him. The second story is found in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. The story's longer. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 4. And I think this is a, a case where the memorial built to God is prayer, worship, and gifts raised to God from a reverent heart. 
prayer, worship, and gifts raised to God from a reverent heart. Look at Acts chapter 10, the first four verses. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need <clears throat> and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. <clears throat> Excuse me. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What, what is it, Lord? He, he asked, and the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor, listen, have come up as a memorial offering before God. That's two times that idea is talked about. And again, I can't find any other place other than these two stories, these two scriptures, where that is specifically said that these are a memorial, a memorial to me. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He'd proven his skills as a soldier in battle. He was placed in charge of a legion of soldiers, at least 100 men. But even this tough soldier could be changed by God's love. He knew of the God of Israel and spent hours praying and seeking God's face. Now, he didn't fully understand who Jesus was, but he was willing to learn and, and receive whatever it is that God had for him. I love verse 2. Cornelius and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God on a regular basis. And one day, as Cornelius prayed, this angel comes to him and told him, Hey, send for Peter, who's going to lead you to this, this man named Jesus, and he's, he's going to teach you about serving and about living for him. And the presence of the angel kind of terrified this man, even for a Roman soldier. But then look at, again, at verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? The angel, your prayers and your gifts, your alms to the poor have come up here as a memorial offering before God. So why did God recognize it? What did God see? What did he observe? First of all, he noticed that Cornelius was a good man. He was devout and God-fearing, which is kind of an oddity in that day. As a Roman soldier, he was a man of rank among the enemies of the Jews and was a symbol of Caesar's power that held Israel as a conquered people. Think about this. He's despised by most of the Jews, and he's feared by most of the men of his own band. And yet this centurion had renounced all of his Roman gods and confessed, confessed his belief in the one true God of Israel. That couldn't have been easy for him. In fact, it would have been an act of treason against Rome. But Cornelius isn't a man who was afraid of a fight. He wasn't worried about his position. He put it all on the line to serve God. He was a good man. Second, he was a man of prayer. I, I love what God says through the angel. Your prayers have come up. I love that. Your prayers have come up. In the Old Testament tabernacle, there was an item called the altar of incense. A little history lesson here. And a container of, uh, of this special mixture of incense was filled by the priest in the morning and at night so that there was a sweet-smelling smoke which represented the prayers of the people that were issued from it day and night. Check this out. When the people smelled the smoke, no matter where they were, when they smelled the smoke, it reminded them that their prayers were constantly being carried up to God. And I, I wonder, was that continuous act of burning incense, was that on Paul's mind when he told us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing, pray unending. And then you throw into the mix this passage in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. And the prayers of all of God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne, the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. This week in your Core 52 reading, you're going to be reading about prayer, but I want you to know today that your prayers, when you offer them up to God, they rise into the throne room of God, and they become a memorial in His eyes. So I'm just asking, through your prayer life, are you building a memorial before God? Does that describe your prayer life, that just constantly these prayers are being lifted up to God? What else did God notice about Cornelius? He was a man of worship and giving. 
And the reason I say this, because some of the older translations use the word alms. He gave alms. And, and almsgiving can mean two things. It can mean giving your offering, but it can also mean giving your praise and your worship. Cornelius was a generous man. God noticed that. I see him as he walked the streets of Jerusalem, maybe dropping in a few Roman coins into the hands of the beggars on the street. And I would ask you this morning, are you building a memorial before God with your giving? Is that what giving is for you? Is it, in fact, an offering? We, we've called it that for years. Is it an offering that's being raised up or lifted to God? I, I fear sometimes since we've stayed with the red buckets at the door that we've lost that, that essence of this being an act of worship as we place money into a plate and we present that to God. But that's what your stewardship, that's what your giving ought to be. Are you building a memorial before God with your worship, both personally and corporately? 1 Chronicles 16, verse 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. I love Hebrews 13, 15, where we're told, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. Folks, it's not just Sunday morning from 8.30 to 9.30 or whatever, but it's a continual Continual sacrifice, sacrifice of praise that we're to be offering to God. Why? Proclaiming our allegiance to his, his name. Are you building a memorial before God when it comes to your worship of, of God? I'll close with this. I, I think there's a sense in which our lives as a whole are to be a memorial before God. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this. You also like what? Living stones. Are being built into what? A spiritual house. To be what? A holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That, that's our life. Our life is to be a, an offering, a memorial lifted up to God. Note this important truth. We benefit personally as we offer ourselves to God as a sweet sacrifice. But there's also benefit for those who are saved and those who need to be saved. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 15. What's Paul say? For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. What we do has benefit not just for us, but even for those in the body and those outside the body who have not yet come to know of Christ. I love the New Living Translation that says, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Does that describe your life? Is that the way you're living? Is that the way other people see you living? That your, your life is... Just this sweet, sweet sacrifice that every moment of every day is being lifted up to God. Florence Nightingale was once asked what the secret was to her life. And she, ironically enough, is one who took care of wounded soldiers back in the day. And, of course, she's the founder of modern nursing. But they said, what's the secret of your life? And she said, well, I, I can only offer one explanation. It is, I've kept nothing back from God. I've kept nothing back from God. I've held nothing back. I want to be able to say that. I want you to be able to say that. At the end of the day, at the end of your life, it can be said of you, you can say of yourself, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. But I've held nothing back. I've given him everything that I have. I want to pray with you as we close out this part of our service and begin to, to move into a, uh, a closing time of announcements. Can we pray together? If you'd bow, please. God, I, I want to pray for those in the pews this morning. This is probably one of those sermons that made us feel a bit uncomfortable. It shouldn't. It, it should just make us feel as though we're being challenged and stretched and how, God, you've called us to do more and to be more. And I just, I pray in, in this moment, in this moment of worship, that we can truly look at our hearts and, and know whether or not we've offered you everything or if we've just offered the bare minimum. We've just said, well, here's what's expected, here's what's necessary, and that's all I'm giving. I hope this week we can break the tops off some bottles and pour ourselves out for you and for others. 
I'm praying that you'll bring opportunity by our way and that we'll seize those moments to do something for you that would build a memorial to you and you'd take notice of it. You'd recognize, you'd recognize that that is a, a sweet offering being lifted up to you. So God bless us in this moment as we worship and as we commit. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. If you have a decision to make or you need prayer, you can also find you. So desire.
Amen. You may be seated. Wow, we ought to sing that song every Sunday, don't you think? Hey, Trevor's going to introduce our graduates to us in just a moment. I'm just going to remind you of some things. Uh, first of all, there are graduation receptions taking place yet today that we've been invited to. All those are posted on the bulletin board if you want to go by and get times and addresses for that. If you didn't get your Easter family picture, they're at the hospitality desk. They're alphabetized. Oh, you okay? Good job, man. I just like to be able to move that fast. I, that ship's already sailed. Don't want to hurt the guitar player. Keep him healthy. Anyway, pick up your Easter family picture if you would. And then if you want to sign your uh, student up for uh, camp at Lake Springfield Christian Assembly. We had a few kids sign up last week. We're, we're excited about that. So you can talk to Trevor Moore about uh, getting them signed up. Take it away, Trevor. All right. Uh, this morning we want to write, uh, congratulate our graduates of eighth grade and high schoolers. Um, so if you're here this morning, can you say your name? Would you please come up here? If we miss someone, please be patient with us. Tell us. We'll get you a book. Uh, but we want to start with our eighth grade graduates. Uh, first is Haley Beller. Uh, she joins us in youth group uh, quite often. Lauren Coate is the next one to join you. Uh, Carter Davis, I talked with Beth. She's not here this morning. We're going to get you a book. Maddie McGovern, I know you're here. There's Maddie. Maddie graduated in eighth grade this year. Uh, and last is Jaden Stevenson. Jaden uh, also attends with us uh, at our junior high level as well. So that's our eighth grade graduates. Congratulations, Maddie. <laughs> Next is our high school graduates. So if you're here this morning, again, just come forward. Uh, Mary Frank, she jumped the pew. I like it. <laughs> Excited about being up here. Uh, Treshawn Grant, I believe he's a second service uh, goer. Rachel Hager is also a second service goer. James Level is also a second service goer. Uh, Walker Peterson, I know he's back there. Wyatt Peterson, I know he's also back there in the back. And last is Ethan Ross, who I believe uh, attends the second service quite often as well. Uh, just congratulations to you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> just want to say congratulations uh, to myself and this church family. Uh, we wish you guys nothing but the best. Uh, wherever your future takes you, uh, Maddie, she'll be going into high school. We hope to see your face more often. Uh, but for those that are graduating high school, we also hope to see your face uh, often. Please understand, you are always welcome to come back. Uh, if you're here just visiting or here back to stay, I'm fine with that as well. Um, and, and don't be uh, scared to show up at youth group and stuff like that as well. Uh, we, like I said, we did do our congratulations. Good job, well done. And we wish you nothing but the best in the future. I'm going to have a prayer, and I think that will kind of close us out uh, for this morning. So thanks for joining us. And for those that are visiting, uh, you're always welcome back. And you can join us at any time. So let's pray. Let's stand, Gordon said. Then let's pray. God, we thank you uh, for these individuals on the stage uh, and really their dedication to you um, first and foremost. Thank you for who they are and what they represent, how they re represent us as well uh, here at SCC. God, we pray uh, for those graduating seniors as they, they move on uh, to a new chapter of their life, um, that you will guide them and speak to them and, and guard their hearts um, as they start to experience uh, new world things and, and new chapter uh, that they're sure, surely excited about. God, we pray for those eighth graders as they bump up into high school, um, that you'll just be with them, uh, give them reassurance that you're with them every step of the way. God, we thank you for what uh, these students mean to us here at SCC, and we thank you for just our chance to be able to, to, to dive into them and to help them hopefully grow into that faith that you want them to have for you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. You are dismissed.